The next uh, three lectures will be talking about medieval cities, and I hope that the other two-thirds of the class can at least come to one of those. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, it's very disappointing. Um, the um, first two of these lectures deal with Europe for the purpose of continuity because that is where the influence of Rome remained the strongest even after its decline. And then we will look at cities in Africa and Arabia, some of which were influenced by Rome, some parts of it influenced by Rome, some parts not, um, and conclude with um, sort of making a, a sort of comparison, typological comparison between uh, those cities and the European medieval city. The, um, <clears throat> before we begin this, let me say that uh, the great French urban historian Henri Perrin wrote that we know more about Iron Age cities than we do about cities, uh, European cities, uh, between the 6th and the 11th centuries um, of the Common Era. And I think this is true. Uh, all of the Latin West goes into a fairly serious decline in the beginning in the 5th and into the 6th century. And uh, it probably is worth spending uh, just a moment to talk about the rise of the feudal system. Once we get past about the 11th to 12th century, we see the reemergence of markets. And we see the reemergence of writing, primarily through the church, primarily through religious foundations. And what we have that has survived from the classical world, actually, uh, we owe to these monasteries more than to anything else. Um, and that's probably why it's so random, because it was just simply abandoned. Uh, we, we do have little bits and pieces of, for example, um, in Ireland, people burning books uh, to keep warm in the wintertime, you know, that sort of thing. Um, in order to understand the conditions um, at the end of the Roman world, uh, I want to read just a, a little bit of this. This is uh, written by Bede or Beda. The text was written in 710 um, of the Common Era, and he is living uh, on the island of Lindisfarne in a monastery. Um, Lindisfarne was in the north uh, of, of England, just south of Scotland, south of Newcastle upon Tyne. Newcastle was actually a Roman foundation. Uh, Lindisfarne was not, but it was here that um, the old Roman province of Britannia took the, the, the full onslaught of the Norse uh, invasions, the uh, Vikings. And, um, and here he is writing uh, the oldest surviving text, the oldest surviving history we actually have um, in English, the English translation, translation from the Latin would be an ecclesiastical history of the English-speaking people. Now, when he talks about English speaking, if you looked at the English he was speaking, you wouldn't recognize it. It would look more like some archaic form of German. Uh, it was not at all what, what you, if you heard it spoken, you wouldn't understand any of it. Um, in the year of our Lord, 449, Martian became emperor with Valentinian, the 46th in succession from Augustus. Now, here he is living on an island off the coast, north coast of England. Right? And he's writing about 449. How does he identify himself here? He's Roman. He's writing in the year 449, year of our Lord, he's Christian, 449, Martian becomes emperor with Valentinian, the 46th in succession from Augustus. Now those, of course, are what we would call Byzantine emperors in what is now Istanbul. Nonetheless, that's who he identifies with. Um, in this time, in his time, the Angles and the Saxons came to Britain at the invitation of King Vortigern in three long ships and were granted lands in the eastern part of the island on condition that they protect the country. Nevertheless, their real intention was to subdue it. They engaged the enemy advancing from the north. That's the Norse, the Vikings. Having defeated them, sent back news of their success to their homeland, adding that the country was fertile, the Britons cowards, <laughs> whereupon a larger fleet quickly came over with a great body of warriors, which, when joined to the original forces, constituted an invincible army. These also 
received from the Britons grants of land where they could settle among them on condition that they maintained peace and security of the island against all enemies in return for regular pay. Now, what's left out of this is that in order to defend against the Rhine, um, Rome had withdrawn the legions from the province of Britannia in the late 4th century. So they had been pretty much up there on their own, unprotected by an army, and thus these Norse invasions. I'll skip over the next part, but this description is fairly chilling. It says, It was not long before such hordes of these alien peoples vied together to crowd into the island that the natives who had invited them began to live in terror. Then all of a sudden, the Angles made an alliance with the Picts. The Picts are people who were living in today what we call Scotland, whom by this time they had driven some distance away and began to turn their arms against their allies. They began by demanding a greater supply of provisions, then threatened that unless larger supplies were provided by the local population, they would terminate their treaty and ravage the whole island. Nor were they slow to extinguish fires kindled by the pagans and proved to be God's just punishment for the sins of the nation. Um, clearly, he sees this uh, sort of holocaust unfolding as being a uh, punishment for the wicked ways of those who had strayed, actually, from the teachings of Jesus. Even making comparison to the fires once kindled by the Chaldeans destroyed the walls and the buildings of Jerusalem. For as the just judge ordained, these heathen conquerors devastated the surrounding cities and countryside, extended the conflagration from the eastern to the western shores without opposition, and established a stranglehold over nearly all the doomed island. Public and private buildings were raised, priests slain at the altar, bishops and people alike, regardless of rank, destroyed with fire and sword, and none remained to bury those who had suffered such a cruel death. A few wretched survivors captured in the hills were butchered wholesale, and others desperate with hunger came out and surrendered to the enemy for food, although they were doomed to lifelong slavery, even if they escaped instant massacre. Some fled overseas in their misery. Others, clinging to their homeland, eked out a wretched and fearful existence among the mountains, forests, crags, and so forth, ever on the alert for danger. Now, what had happened here is that the old Roman state had fallen away. But if we are to understand in the face of this kind of invasion uh, what, in fact, remained of that sort of Roman world, I think it's necessary to go back and look at something I mentioned in the last lecture, the patron-client system. At its core um, of the Roman social system, a pater familias, literally the father of the family, would have a number of clients. A client was a loyal supporter of the family who was indebted to a patron. The better the list of clients, the higher the social standing of the family. This system dates to the earliest days of Rome and possibly even before. This system, known as clientela, was held together by three core Roman virtues, and it is impossible to overestimate the importance of these in the Roman world. The first is fides, or fidelity, that is loyalty. This held families together as well as the social order through this client system. You were faithful and true to your patron, and your patron was faithful and true to the client. This lay at the core of the Roman idea of a contract, and our idea of the inviolable nature of a contract comes from that, comes from, actually comes from Rome, encoded into law, and it was the underpinning of the concept of the rule of law. Pietas, piety meaning the dedication to the state with honor, putting others before yourself. In the Christian period, piety meant sort of you lived a life without strong drink and you kept the commandments and you did all these things. But um, originally it meant that you, in fact, put others before yourself, that you put the welfare of the whole before the individual. The strict definition from Cicero would be the conduct of the man who performed all his duties toward the deity and toward his fellow human beings fully and in every respect. Thus, the greatest pious act was fidelity to the Roman state, that is, to the collective order. And if you achieved the first two of those, then you were granted the benefit of libertas, the freedom to engage in public, political, social, and economic life, to be a free citizen. This was the benefit of adhering to fides and pietas. But with the dissolution of the Roman state, 
which had been underwritten by the rule of law and enforced by the army, trade, organization, standardization of time, monetary units, etc., ceased. Slowly, the world closed in on itself, and all the wealth was in the land, not through trade. What you could grow on it, graze on it, or dig out of it. Ownership, then, and control of land became the only means of generating any wealth, even at a subsistence level. So the patron-client system lapsed into individual contractual bonds known as an oath of fealty between individuals who developed into warlords. The weaker lord pledged an oath of fealty to the stronger lord, who in turn would protect the weaker lords. When the Roman state fell away, the church assumed some of these core values as well as a central hierarchical organization, but the concepts were transformed from civil values to Christian values. For example, piety became, um, came to partially mean living without sin toward the hope of reward and a better world in heaven. In the words of Lucretius then, beyond the flaming ramparts of this world. So on the one hand, while the church is retaining some of the organization, hierarchy, and so forth, it is in fact transferring those core Roman values into something which is aimed at ensuring your place in heaven, in effect, okay, the end of time, where um, this world really had to do with your survival being protected by someone who was stronger than you were. Uh, the bigger guy on the playground who, uh, when the bully picks on you, they stand up for you, that sort of thing. Because all wealth is in the land and there is no trade, then the more land you controlled and the larger the base of these oaths of fealty that you had toward a single warlord who could protect you, um, in fact, uh, became the means of survival. And so what we see is the complete collapse of the rule of law, and instead um, that which is armed and defensible, and cities undergo a profound transformation in which the sort of open nature of what we see in the Roman city, in fact, uh, collapses back into something that looks a lot like a late Bronze Age city, like Mycenae, protected, protected core like an onion, wall, sometimes two of them, uh, defensive agricultural territory around it. Now, as we move over time in the 13th and 14th centuries, we begin to get the arrival of trade. Uh, the so-called Crusades, that is, this misbegotten notion that uh, Christian Western Europe had of sort of somehow reclaiming uh, you know, the Levant reclaiming what, what was called the Holy Land from, from Islam, which was successful for about 100 years, created all kinds of chaos. But war does strange things. Sometimes long-term benefits can be derived from what is, in fact, an absolutely terrible thing, still not forgotten. Um, and part of that had to do with the fact that um, these Franks, these, these we're talking here in 1300, 1200, um, the Knights Templars, others, as we'll see, developed systems of banking, systems of credit. Um, people were engaged with one another at a number of levels. A lot of people intermarried. And knowledge that had been split between this Christian North and this Muslim South in the Mediterranean was, even though it was in fragments, it was brought back together. We would not have Vitruvius today if it was not for those events, because Vitruvius, uh, as Alberti tells us, was in fact in fragments, okay? So this, these next two lectures will be um, primarily typological, following Morris, because um, in my view, the, the medieval world is one where uh, cities, no matter how they started out, it's sort of like Ronald Reagan once said, if you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all. Um, I think there's some truth to that about medieval cities in Europe. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. They all have the same components. They all have the same... Uh, elements, and they tended to operate the same way. Now, the, the examples we will be looking at are not examples from the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries. They're examples uh, because those cities, we, they're gone, basically. Uh, the, 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 these are really examples um, that um, remained by, say, the 13th century, okay? Um, there are five types in terms of origin of um, medieval cities in Europe. And um, the first of these is towns of Roman origin. Uh, Rome, for example, it shrank. Uh, it went away. The aqueducts were severed. But there were still about 50,000 people living there. They didn't have adequate water supply, so they, the center of the city 
shifted into the floodplain in an area known as the Campus Martius, so the Campus Margio, Marzio, the field of Mars, which had in fact been um, originally in the, by the second century uh, of the Common Era, had actually been a uh, sort of entertainment district with baths and temples and theaters and other kinds of things. Um, Turin, Roxford, Jerusalem, Aosta, York, Winchester, Paris, London, these cities did not disappear. Uh, but they underwent profound transformations during uh, this medieval period. The second type was a burg, and with, this is usually contained, not always, but usually contained within the name. Uh, Strasbourg, Edinburgh, Fribourg, and so forth, these are um, contained within them, um, this concept of the burg. Now, these could develop out of Roman towns, Strasbourg, Freiburg, or they could be developed around, around the seat of a warlord on a defensible site. Uh, even a Roman villa, if it was in fact out in the countryside, a kind of working farm, could in fact be transformed into a burg, um, and in so doing, no remnant of the villa remained. We'll talk a little bit about villas later but, uh, and their significance, but uh, they, could, they, they began to develop defensive walls and so forth. Um, and then eventually, um, and sometimes they were founded by the church. Durham is an example that we will see where you actually had the bishop who was, uh, it was a walled, defensible military compound um, as well as the seat of a bishop. The, um, over time, uh, enough uh, consolidation in the feudal system developed so that faubourgs began to develop, often requiring defensive walls of their own. These contained market functions and sometimes the seat of a bishop or as a religious institution. Not all of them used the term burg. Chinon in France is an example. Uh, Loche also in France is an example of that. We'll see these later. Third is what Morris calls organic growth towns. You know that I am opposed to that notion. It is a misnomer. They were usually planned agricultural settlements intended to house agricultural workers. Land was owned by a wealthy overlord who provided protection. The term organic refers to the free-form circumstantial nature of their development, their form, uh, their growth by a process of accretion. Um, they, they, they were not sort of, as I said, you know, uh, something growing in a petri dish or weeds in your lawn. They were, they were not organic in that sense, right? But, um, but they take a form which is, does not have orthogonal geometry, does not have any sort of particular notion of being planned, any higher idea was simply to house people within a territory controlled by a powerful lord so that um, they could get to the fields, right? Get to the fields more easily. By the 13th century, when markets begin to redevelop and trade begins again, as more and more of this territory has been consolidated under this feudal economy, uh, feudal alliances created enough political stability so that kings began the practice of establishing colonies. These were planned communities, and here we see orthogonal geometries. Uh, here we see clear, um, even though they had all the components of a burg or the components of a medieval city of Roman origin, in fact, or even an organic town in some cases, they actually uh, would often uh, be clearly planned as a unit, like Olynthus in Greece was planned as a unit. Um, we see these particularly in southern France, Spain, Switzerland, and Austria. And then finally, a, uh, the fifth type, which is really a sort of 4A, I guess, or a 4B, uh, is a type of planted town with associated military or defense functions. In other words, the king would go out into a territory that was sort of in a no man's land and establish a bastide. The bastide was a defensible outpost planned as a unit. Uh, confined mostly to England and southern France after 1300 um, of the Common Era. Montpazier is the example that we will look at. So let's just go through these in order. Towns of Roman origin. This is actually Silchester um, in uh, Chester from Castrum, um, originally a Roman military camp that was ultimately um, converted into a Roman civitatis. This is uh, Kaleva, the Roman city of Kaleva. Now, Silchester, you can see clearly the Roman pattern, and there you can see it uh, from a balloon photograph or an aerial photograph um, after a lot of rain. 
So you can actually see where the town no longer exists, but you can see here in the plowed fields where the forum was right there in the center. You can see the insula, the blocks of the city, uh, because the shallower soil is actually uh, where the roads were showing up here as yellow. Another example would be the Roman city of Augusta Praetoria, a colonia uh, founded by the Emperor Augustus, uh, which became medieval Aosta in northern Italy. And uh, you can see the uh, pomerium here is now the medieval wall. You can see the uh, gates of the city, the Roman streets. And then you'll notice how the, uh, the departure from that strict grid in this, quote, to use Morris's term, organic pattern, um, that um, is actually the medieval city. There we see it today, the Roman streets. The church is actually built on the site of the Forum. Uh, there we see a little bit better uh, image of it. And there we have inserted on the top the, um, the Roman city of Augusta Pretoria. You can, tra you can trace this over and over again. You can do it in Florence. You can do it in Jerusalem. You can do it in lots of cities that were very much like this. Now, this process of conversion... And here, again, England is a very good example of this for two reasons. One is it was on the fringe of the Roman world, and so the legions were withdrawn. And because of that, it was the first to undergo the sort of blunt trauma of these uh, Teutonic and Nordic invasions. Um, the second is the British, you know, it's a small island, and um, uh, I've never really understood them very much. They only recently learned how to cook by doing something other than boil it. That's a joke. Um, I was actually in England one time. I hadn't seen anything green in about two weeks. And uh, I was in Salisbury, uh, which we'll see in a moment. And this waitress came and said, would you like a choice of vegetables? And boy, I was said, yeah. You know, I was imagining spinach or, you know, carrots or something. You know? So she comes out with this tray, and she has mashed potatoes, boiled potatoes, and fried potatoes. That was my choice of three kinds of vegetables. It tells you something about the Brits. No, they're on a small island, so they were bored, and they couldn't cook anything worth eating, so they mapped it. They mapped the whole island. I'm saying that slightly tongue-in-cheek, but there's a certain amount of truth in that. The British Ordnance Surveys are some of the most detailed surveys that we have. They had this strange organization, sort of like the National Geographic Society. or the, It was called the Society for the Improvement of Useful Knowledge. And they went around the world at the time of their great expansion in the 19th century, and they made maps. They mapped everything. Uh, so the point being is that um, archaeology in England is actually fairly advanced and was advanced in the 19th century, and they were very meticulous, very meticulous in how they mapped these things. So we know more about this than we do in a lot of places like France, for example, or Germany, or even in Italy, which is just chalked to the gills with all this stuff. Um, the top shows the reconstruction here, um, in other words, the conception of, based on the archaeological evidence, of where the basilica was um, in, a, in a city called Viraconium, which later became Roxeter in the process of it, the Germanic overlay in the language. Uh, and this is derived from the pavement and the foundation walls, uh, as we'll see in the next slide. And then... What you're looking at at the bottom is approximately 100, 100 years of Anglo-Saxon settlement where they had no need for a law court, right? They had no need that the sort of tribal leader was, in fact, um, the king or the was the court, in effect. And so this has turned into the great hall of the king. And um, um, the basilica, of course, uh, disappears as a law court although the form of the building is retained for Christian congregational worship in monastic foundations. Uh, here we see a Roman bath, which was adjacent to the basilica. There you see the basilica up here, and then here's a Roman bath, a bit unusual around the forum. Um, and then here are the excavations uh, in which the hypocaust is clearly visible. The basilica was the large building down here at the lower portion of this photograph, converted into a medieval guild hall. And we can see the extent to which these, this invasion coming from um, Denmark and coming from northern Germany and coming from what is now the Scandinavian countries, moving um, east to west, uh, pushing then these Romano Brits to the west um, up against the, the limits in what is now Wales, and then eventually many of them going across 
and forming uh, Brittany, the, pro the French province, now they're considered to be uh, French. It is probable, in fact, that the Arthurian legends have some kernel of truth um, of a Romano-Brit who is trying to defend against uh, these invasions. Well, what's left? Um, if we look then in the west, Winchester, which was a sub-provincial capital, probably a uh, castrum that was later converted eventually into a colonia. Um, we have a, um, the Chester actually indicates castrum, and the itch, as I mentioned earlier, indicates a vicus. And we can quite clearly see in the street and block pattern of Winchester uh, the Roman city. Uh, we can see actually B as the Cardo, and A as the Pomerium, and C as the Decumanus. And then the site of the Capitolium and the Forum, B on the large map, actually becomes um, the area in which the cathedral will be built, the seat of the bishop. And we see this a lot. We see where uh, the church will actually um, appropriate the site of the Roman Forum, and oftentimes even appropriating the basilica itself in order uh, to create um, uh, a building from it. In this case, the building is built from scratch, uh, but it is built on the site of the, of the Forum. The uh, capital of, uh, of Roman Britannia was, in fact, York, as I've already mentioned, Eburacum, founded in 71 of the Common Era in the reign of the Emperor Vespasian, and it served as the capital of the province of Britannia until 410 um, A.D. And um, there you actually see the uh, Roman the Cardo, Decumanus, all the sort of constituent parts that, that you're familiar with. Then later, its expansion across the river. Uh, later then, in the um, medieval period, after the withdrawal of the legions by 410, they had constructed a fortified uh, settlement here on this hill. And there we see it today. That fortified settlement will become a castle. And then A and B is the site uh, in red is the site of the Capitolium and the site of the Basilica, which lies underneath York Minster, underneath the, uh, the church. Some of the streets, although they departed very much like what we saw in Aosta, actually still exist. And um, there we see a reconstruction drawing conjectural of the Basilica at York, which uh, was located right here on the south transept of the cathedral. Uh, the Roman sewers have been um, found and mapped. And then the wall, the Roman wall, the ancient pomerium, has actually been reconstructed. It's interesting because people walk to work along this wall. And then here we're on Stone Street in which we actually, um, Stonegate Street, in, we see sidewalks. Um, Roman streets had sidewalks. Medieval streets, as we'll see later um, in Paris, for example, do not have sidewalks. And um, it is the presence of the sidewalk in part that gives us away. It's more or less straight alignment. And if we compare Stonegate Street to the Decumanus Inferiore in Herculaneum, we see that, in fact, if we stripped away all of this sort of late medieval material, we would probably have this underneath it. This has occurred in the Souk Zeit in Jerusalem. Uh, where Israeli archaeologists actually pulled away uh, the facades of a few market buildings, not very much, an area from about here to the front door of this building, along the old Roman Cardo, in which it revealed these fourth century columns and facades running along this ancient Roman Cardo. Um, the burg, uh, other terms, burra, burg, burg, uh, it comes from an old English Germanic term, burr, a dwelling or dwellings with a fortified enclosure. Uh, some of these were occupied um, older, much older, such as uh, Serum, which was an Iron Age hill fort that actually had been occupied by the Romans and then was abandoned and then reoccupied um, by the Romano Brits during this period of the 5th century and then ultimately grew into um, the seat of a bishop and a town. Water was a problem here. Uh, it was up on a hill overlooking this easily defendable but overlooking and overlooking Salisbury, Salisbury Plain. That's the view from up there. You see here the foundations of the church. And um, by about 1300, 
They actually had um, outgrown this substantially, and uh, they moved down in the valley, as we'll see, and created one of these planted towns, a planned town, which was the town of Salisbury. Uh, here is the uh, military part, which was actually the seat of the, of the Lord, and then here is the seat of the bishop. Each of these were walled, and then everybody else is crammed into the interstitial space in between. Not very big. We're standing here in the center of the church, looking up at the, the castle or the donjon or the keep, the most inner sanctum, fortified sanctum of the, this burg. Another would be Edinburgh, where um, the extinct core of an old, 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 old volcano, surrounded, in fact, by water, on originally on three sides, with a long ridge coming back down here to the palace of the bishop, in which, I don't, when you download this and look at it, you'll notice that, in fact, the main street that we see, now called the High Street, changes names four times as it moves down that one street. Um, Atlanta has streets like that, but it, the, the names change for different reasons. It's because one street got started moving this way, and the other street got started moving that way, and uh, when they met, they, the names, they just never got around to changing the names. Um, but here, it's actually um, in part because each of these had a different function. So we have the lawn market, we have the hay market, we have the high street, we have cannon gate, and we have the Palace of the Holy Rood, the Palace of the Bishop down here. And then here is the Palace of the, or the Castle, the fortified um, home of the Kings of Scotland, fortified around this lock so that you could, the only land approach was actually from one side. Later we'll see Edinburgh as it is transformed. Um, this was, a t you can imagine living here, uh, very tall buildings, very unstable, buildings collapsed, inadequate water, no sewage, no sewers. Um, disease was rampant, and uh, you see that where the street widened, uh, that is where, in fact, you get the market, that is where you get the church, that is where you get all the different things that were associated with the city. Everything else crammed in to these very narrow, dark um, alleys which uh, were uh, filled with all kinds of disease. The example of Durham is interesting because it is an ecclesiastic. It is the seat of a bishop, but... Um, it was actually fortified, fortified very much like what, uh, what we saw at Sarum. Uh, the pink part is the actual cathedral, and then the, uh, which cathedral, by the way, is a title. It means the seat of a bishop. It's not a building type. Um, and then the um, blue part was actually the fortified town associated with, um, with, hard to call it a town, but this was the seat of the bishop. Later, a market by 13, 1400, a market would develop just outside the walls of the bishop's palace that we see here and outside the donjon or the keep. And uh, it would be here that the secular town would begin to develop um, as time wore on. There we see it in its current state. There is that fortified, um, um, fortified tower, the seat of the bishop. Here is the cathedral. We see it from another angle here. And then just outside the gate, the entrance to that, is where the market town developed. This is exactly like Chinon in France, exactly. Now, I am struck by how similar in form and in structure these towns are in the Middle Ages in Europe to these late Bronze Age cities that we talked about earlier in the course. That is, you have uh, a religious building, the seat of a king, walled, fortified as an inner city, a kind of major approach road to that, a wall around that, a cistern in the back here that could, in time of attack, actually uh, provide water supply, so that uh, if we diagram that like an onion, uh, you're protecting the core and then they're sort of radiating out from that. The third category of Morris's organic growth towns, this is when you had a feudal lord had controlled enough territory so that uh, you didn't have to worry about attack every day. And um, it became more efficient to have your serfs, your farmers, uh, the people who were working for you, um, actually um, closer to the fields that they were working. The fields were owned by the feudal lord, and um, some of the more enlightened ones would uh, establish one of these little villages, which then um, would give uh, each of the 
residents their own little plot within a certain small specified area where they could actually uh, grow vegetables. If they had a cow, you could then keep that cow here in the common land, uh, but everything else outside the town was owned by the feudal lord. In the summer of 1985, I was at Cambridge University, and it rained every day for three weeks. I lost 20 pounds. If you ever really want to go on a diet, just move to rural England for three or four months, and you will immediately lose 20 or 30 pounds because the food is inedible. Um, again, that's a joke. Um, actually, it's gotten pretty good of late, but boy, back 20, 30 years ago, it was really awful. In any event, unless you think lasagna made with lamb um, and lettuce and tomato is uh, good, you probably wouldn't do too well with cottage cheese, not ricotta. Bubble and squeak, my favorite. Mashed potatoes, broccoli, green peas, lard, put in a frying pan, fry it up, and serve cold. Woo! <laughs> in any event, um, to entertain myself, I was using the Girton College Library, and I found um, a document from a nearby town called Ely, which was a cathedral town where the bishop got a little too big for his britches, and so um, the archbishop actually demoted him, or promoted him, I should say, uh, to an abbot. Mm -hmm which was, in effect, like putting somebody, giving them a desk job, you know what I mean, in the military or something. And, um, but in those documents, it was really fascinating to read um, what was given, how um, sheep, the, the sheep skins, were uh, divided up among the feudal lord and the bishop and what the people who were raising the sheep for the landlord actually got paid. It was a three-day journey to deliver these skins. It was divided up 60-40 between the feudal lord and the church, and the person delivering them was paid with a loaf of bread. Okay, Pretty interesting. Um, so here, this was fairly enlightened. You got your own, you got your own little place to grow, grow vegetables, and then you got, if you had a cow, or maybe you shared a cow, um, you actually grazed it here with a stockman who actually would, um, would uh, take care of the cow, and then you worked the fields, uh, and in return, so you're a tenant farmer in effect. Okay? Uh, an example of one of these would be Appleton Lemoore's in Yorkshire. Uh, sometimes these would develop into a burg, and here we actually see one of these organic towns uh, this is just a generic diagram from Morris, but we see one of these towns that then is actually um, the church and the castle are actually built outside of it as opposed to in the center of it. And then here we have an example of Workworth in Northumbria, which was founded as a religious establishment in the 8th century um, up at the top, but ultimately um, this became the seat of a feudal lord. There we see the actual castle down here at the end, and then this town that sort of developed in between. And finally, the planted town, uh, such as Salisbury, which was actually a colony of Old Serum, the Borg that was the old Iron Age hill fort, um, going back to pre-Roman period, which was then occupied by the Romano Brits. This Borg developed this wall defensive place. Eventually, they came down in the valley, and they constructed New Serum, which we know of as Salisbury. The Bury is from Berg. Um, founded in 1219, uh, construction began in 1220, and it was divided into two parts, an ecclesiastical section, like Durham, an ecclesiastical section built around the church, and the market town north of the religious precinct known as a sea. And that's what you're looking at here. This is actually... The town, and to this day, by the way, there is a wall right there that separates um, that separates the sea or the seat of the bishop from, in fact, the um, uh, the market town, which is down here, laid out more or less on a grid, a kind of distorted grid. Another example of this would be in France, Aguimort, uh, on the southern coast of France, which was uh, important as as a source of salt. Um, constructed as a defense for salt extraction operations uh, in the mid-14th century. And here we see, again, this sort of grid. It's looking sort of Roman, but it is not Roman. 
uh, it is planned. And, uh, but we have these blocks, this grid structure. And then the space that we see here, uh, usually the widest street uh, at the base of the wall, like right there, you see that right there? That was called um, a bulwark, and it would give us a term that is still in use, boulevard, a boulevard, okay? And it was the space for moving the troops at the base of the wall in time of attack. And finally, the Bastides, Montpazier is the best example. Um, most, as I said, most of these were confined to southern France, some in England. Of course, uh, France was not a country, nor England a country, in the way that it is today. In fact, uh, the Queen of England uh, was from Bordeaux, and she was married to a man who was from Chinon. They spoke French. Um, the King of France was really the King of Orléans, and uh, it was not, um, these countries do not solidify into their modern sort of um, terms until fairly late. This is um, Montpazier, and uh, you can see that it's organized um, into regular insula of individual house plots. There is a sort of planned, arcaded market structure that we see around here adjacent to the church. Uh, because the market was under the control of the church initially. Eventually, that control, the market, will become independent as the strength of the guilds begin to develop or redevelop, and they will wrest the authority away from the, um, from the traditional form of authority, away from the king, away from the church. There's a figure ground of it that we see as it was planned to be built, uh, and then how it actually got built, and then as it is today. It's now a very popular place for people with a reasonable amount of money to, um, to retire to. Um, and if you go to Google Earth, you will notice an inordinate number of swimming pools in the suburbs of Montpazier. It's quite picturesque today, but we can imagine that at the time that it was built, uh, it would not, in fact, have been a very pleasant place to live. Um, the market building, very old, very narrow streets. Notice that there are no facades. The buildings have no facades. The facade is really something which only emerges with the reemergence of the market. Um, you were sort of in an interior world, in effect. Um, public space was actually associated either with the market or with the world to come, the church. Uh, finally, example of uh, Monte Regione, uh, which was built by the city of Siena, by the commune of Siena, as a type of Bastide, oh, come on, uh, a type of Bastide to control agricultural territory, um, both to house the workers for the commune of Siena, more on that later, uh, but also to defend against uh, invaders, against Pisa, against the Florentines, against these other cities that would emerge as city-states that wanted control of that land. Are there any questions? Yes? Well, yeah, they were all Roman towns. They were towns that were Abandoned and then, uh, or not abandoned, but but uh, they they were founded by Rome, so they went through all the same the same founding rituals that any of those towns, thousands of them. Um, and yeah, you can see all the component parts perfectly. I failed to mention something very important. There will be I'll put this on T square, but let me mention it now. There will be a study session next Tuesday for the test in the Architecture Auditorium. That's room 123 of the West Architecture Building. I wanted to do it on Wednesday. I'm out of town on Thursday. I wanted to do it on Wednesday, but there's a lecture, Gamble and Gamble. Mike and Leanne Gamble will be giving, uh, showing their work. And so I had to move it to Tuesday because it was the only time uh, that the room was available. Um, so I didn't want to schedule something against Mike's lecture. So um, we, will, we will do that on Tuesday. And um, in the Architecture Auditorium at 6 p.m., 6 to 7 p.m., okay? And I will put a notice on, on T-Square for that.
I've also uploaded um, the test uh, from 2011.